There you go. Stop and start. All right. So 2 Corinthians 10, 1 to 18. The red light is on, right? Yep. Yeah, it's a good one. All right. Very good. Um, Lord of glory. Lord of glory, you have bought us with your life, but as the price, never grudging for the lost ones that tremendous sacrifice, and with that have freely given blessings countless as the sand to the unfaithful and the evil with your own unsparing hand. Grant us hearts, dear Lord, to give you gladly freely of your own with the sunshine of your goodness melt our thankless hearts of stone. Till our cold and selfish natures warm by you and thee, <coughs> more happy and more blessed tis to give and to receive. Wondrous honor you have given to our humblest charity. In your own mysterious sentence, you have done it all to me. Can it be, O oh gracious Master, that you deign for all to sue, saying by your poor and needy, Give as I have given to you. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, how easy it is for us to respond to unjust and unfair actions by returning those actions in kind. Capture our thoughts through the Savior and enable us to respond with your kind of mercy, love, and strength. Amen. All right, so a whole day spent meditating on one verse. Second Corinthians 10 verse 1 I Paul therefore entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ I who am humble when face to face with you and bold towards you when I am away that's it it was a lot <laughs> I'm new oh where's he at uh I don't know <laughs> So, I'm going to go with what it is. All right. All right. Um, while Paul had won back the congregation at Corinth, as a whole, some at Corinth still opposed Paul and attempted to alienate the Corinthians. From him, Paul now deals with those false teachers who had attempted to undermine his authority. What charge apparently made, what charge apparently made against Paul is reflected in this verse. The humble person who bold in the way. Yeah, so so um, uh, so what's the chart? What's he's the weak. charge then? Right, so he is weak. He is a coward when he's face to face yeah. with people, and he only has boldness when he um, is at a distance, right? Writing a letter. So he writes with strong words, but then he acts with weakness. Kind of like social media. Kind of like social media, right? You can write anything on social media, be as bold as you want, but if you are facing, hey, are you here going to be here for chapel? Huh? Are you going to be here? Oh, Vicar just went down to figure out chapel because you texted him. We were joking because he said. He didn't think you were joking. He went down to figure out chapel. <laughs> All right, away with you. <laughs> I'm leaving, by the way. Uh, all right, so, uh, yeah, very much like social media, right? You can be as bold as you want social media, but then you're a complete coward when you're face-to-face -face with people. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a great example of what they're accusing him of. Now, um, uh, sadly, I think the social media thing is really very true. Um, 
Whereas Paul's whole point is it's not true, right? Yeah. But I think in Paul's case, I said, he saw what was going on there. He had to be firm. There's no two ways about it. He had to be firm because he was not there to do the the one-on-one, -on -one, the, the face to face interaction with the folks. Yes. So we're going to actually get to that um, in a minute here, I think. Um, so um, just, I don't know, last point on that maybe. Yeah, right. So there were some that seemed to misunderstand his gentle, meek, and tender Christian character as weakness, right? And that's, uh, and that's kind of what your, what your author is shooting for really in this whole section of chapter 10 is to understand that gentleness, meekness, tenderness as a Christian character is not weakness um, as a Christian <clears throat> or weakness in character. So let it be, what positive quality of the way Paul had dealt with the Corinthians might be distorted to make this charge? What positive quality of the way Paul had dealt with the Corinthians might be distorted to make this charge? Well, you said that he was gentle like Christ. All right, so he was gentle like Christ. But firm. Um, he admonished them yeah. through his letters, right? First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, there are some pretty heavy admonishment. I mean, it's it's kind of true that he's kind of heavy-handed in his letters, right? His love for them. Um, and then in person, then, his love for them, um, his patience for them. Um, I think uh, ultimately, right, it's his consideration for weak Christians um, in person that uh, kind of drives what he does a little bit. I don't know, any other thoughts on that? Well, just that the, that was <coughs> perceived, you know, from the eyes of the world as being weak rather than strong. Yes, all all perception, all perception, um, and nothing that was real. Right. He's kidding. I know. <laughs> I said. I said to. He said. Oh no, we were just joking around. I was like. Vicker did not know you were joking. He's down preparing chapel. I didn't care. I was like, uh, yeah. It's funny. Uh, Paul refers to the meekness and gentleness of Christ. How is Christ's meekness and gentleness presented in the following passages? So Matthew 11. <coughs> He's described as being gentle, lowly in heart, from yeah. refuge. Jesus even, I mean, Jesus describes himself, yeah. right? Jesus says, uh, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, right? Um, uh, but, at the same time then, what else does he do in those verses? Take my go. Yeah, he, call, he calls for people to, um, he calls for, he, he calls for people to come so that he can actually take their burdens. And if you think about that, if you think about that, that is not a sign of weakness at all, right? So he is gent So the point, the point here um, is that he is gentle, uh, lowly in heart, but he carries other burdens. So I mean, this isn't his gentleness and lowliness is not a weakness because he carries burdens, and that's that has nothing weak about it. But I think that contrasts the yoke of the law, which is heavy and burdensome and, and almost crushing as opposed to his yoke of the gospel. Right. Well, and that's why, um, see, that's why when he bears, when he bears the yoke of others, right, that's what he's bearing. He's bearing the yoke of the law. And that's not, that is not, there's nothing weak about what he's doing, even though he's gentle and lowly in heart. Right. So Paul is making a comparison. Just because I'm gentle and lowly in heart doesn't mean that I'm weak. And then I think the other one, um, Matthew 21, how is Jesus described? How does Matthew describe Jesus? I picked up he was humble. Uh, right? Gentle, humble, riding on a donkey. Um, but where is he riding that donkey to? To To Calvary. To his death, to Calvary, to the cross, right? And, and so riding to the cross... Um, doesn't imply any kind of weakness, weakness or cowardice, yeah. right? So, so just because he's gentle and lowly and humble doesn't mean that he's 
um, weak doesn't mean that he's a coward. And so I think Paul is usurping that same kind of idea for himself, right? Um, meekness and gentleness may be abused from what you know from previous lessons touching on Paul's troubles with the Corinthians. How do you think Paul's meekness and gentleness had been abused? Well, I said, you know, it, it may be the Corinthians listened to these false teachers and about how weak he was, and that kind of led them away from him a little bit because they listened to that and they saw that in his mannerisms and he was gentle and they were probably looking for some kind of like the televangelist loud, you know, for commanding. Yeah, just commanding <coughs> presence versus this well, I think I mean the these other Corinthians were ridiculing and mocking right. Paul. You know, as some of our lovely politicians on all sides do. Yeah. You know, to make the other person look bad. Yeah, so they they were impugning his character, mm -hmm. his authority, challenging his motives. All right, all of those things that we see or that we, well, we have seen and will see even more in the upcoming presidential elections. Right, that's, yeah, we'll be, that's, are we looking? We will, we will live that out. My brother Joe got like doorknobs in China. That's why we're moving yeah. to Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> Just, not committing TV hearing. They still have smoke signals out there. There you go. Well, I think because he wasn't there, that gave them an opportunity to say, hey, look, he's not even here. That's how little he cares for you. Mm -hmm. so, yes, uh, they, right. Say, we're here, follow us, because we aren't going to leave you. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Good. And that's, and, and really, I mean, at the, at the core of it is, is what is Paul far more concerned with? Their salvation. Yeah. yeah, right. He's far more concerned with the Corinthians' welfare and the gospel, and doesn't doesn't really care about um, his character being impugned because he is concerned for the gospel. Why is living, number four A, why is living by the meekness and gentleness of Christ a mark of strength and not weakness for the Christian? <clears throat> It's a reflection of Christ, indicative or absolute trust in God. Yeah, okay, so so it exhibits a strong faith, right? It exhibits a strong faith, that absolute trust in uh, the Lord, right? And trust that the Lord will care for us and defend us. When I say, if you speak in love and truth, that's the way Christ did. Yes, right? So emulate, right? Um, Christ spoke in love, but in truth, right? And that's why uh, uh, Peter, 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 is it Peter? Peter says, um, speak the truth in love, right? Speak the truth in love. Um, that's, that's how Christ did it. That's, what, uh, that's how Paul is doing it. Why is living by the meekness and gentleness of Christ a mark of strength and not of weakness for the Christian? That's one we just, that's one we just read. I think that's kind of hard to do. <laughs> what? I said because it's hard to do. Well, there we go. See, Pam, Pam wasn't done. So <laughs> that's why I read it again. All right. I had that um, same type of answer. Yeah, it's just, you yeah. because, it, uh, because it's hard to do. That's actually a really... Uh, uh, that seems kind of like the duh answer, but I think that's a really good answer, right? It, it, it's a, actually living by the meekness and gentleness of Christ as a sign of strength because it is hard to do, right? Our sinful flesh acts against that, and it's all, only by the help of the Holy Spirit that we're able to live um, meekly and gently um, before others, before other Christians, before the world, um, so yeah, it's hard to do. Um, huh, that's really that's well, a good I answer. Said, you know, if, if someone is not a believer, I think some of these fury and well, what's the term? Fury preachers that just preach sin, sin, sin. Oh yeah. That just hellfire and damnation yeah. preachers. 
turns people away from, from even thinking that God is yes. Christ. So, you know, some people might be attracted to that style, but they're probably already believers, but they're believing because of fear, probably, instead of... Yes. No, I, I think so, right? So, uh, uh, meekness and gentleness serves the gospel um, far more than um, anything, any other uh, kind of pattern. Um, letter B, give some practical ways to go about living by meekness and gentleness. You don't have to get upset or rattled. Just humbly, humbly witness, and um, it takes a lot more energy to, to engage in a bad way. It, it's much more. I, I think the word that Jesus used in Matthew was comfort of the soul. You just state state what you're supposed to state as a Christian, and um, you don't have to be upset and rattled about it. I don't do very well at that, but. Um, no, right? I mean, the uh, again, our sinful nature wants to react engage. strongly and engage, engage um, hostility with hostility, anger with anger, frustration with frustration. Right? I um, saw a post on Facebook last night. Someone was wronged, and the words coming forth were harsh. Would be a mild way of saying it. Right. So to have your pastor see that and comment um, might 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 be sort of an interesting uh, <laughs> interesting well, kind of thing. It doesn't really. It doesn't. Uh, it, it was actually Sue things. complaining about you. No. It doesn't. Really. It, it doesn't really impact what I say because you know I I've always I try to make sure that you know the word my words that are on paper um, you know. I, I could be fine with them at any time. But, you know, having pastor friends, you know, that sometimes, you know, you know, it's like, okay, sometimes, am I okay with this? Sometimes it makes you double think, acting with hostility towards hostility and anger. Right? Yeah, well, and then I also, it's like, okay, if my granddaughter were to see this, would I be okay with it? Right. Is right. this the way, you know, I want, you know, when I go back and look ten years from now, yeah. you know, am I, am I going to be okay with this? And it, 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 a lot of times I type, 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 delete, 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 delete. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You always told us when we were sending emails that were, were when you were emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. yeah, Regardless. <laughs> close yeah. it out, delete it, it as a draft. No, no, <laughs> close it out, delete, save it as a draft, sleep on it, come back and then fix it the next day. That's what well, and, 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 and the, the other really good thing to do is not to put anybody in the two line so that yeah. it can't go by accident. Yeah, that's, <laughs> good, that's a good point. Oh, that's very funny. That's very funny, yeah. Right, so, so that's the... Uh, no, I think that's a great one. That's a great one, um, Nancy, just to uh, not, not react verbally or typing, right, Facebook, email, that, I think that's still verbal, right? Not, not to react verbally in kind, right? So, I mean, that's, and that's tough. I face that as a pastor, right? I mean, people fire off mean emails, and it's like, wow, you, you are so sinful and damnable and hell-bound right now, and I so badly want to tell you that, right? And it's like... It's like, oh, refrain, refrain, refrain. <laughs> Be kind and loving, right? And um, But I'll always truthful. But truthful, right? I mean, right. So so um, a, uh, a truthful email saying that you are incorrect on these things. Um, and, and, you know, but whatever, right? Um, but, uh, or, or no email at all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've just chosen to accept that scathing email and say goodbye from a distance, right? Things like that, right? But, um, yeah, it's, boy, it's, a, a, uh, it's so easy to write the email that fires back, and it's just not 
helpful. But again, again, because of the uh, this perceived anonymity with Facebook, people do it on Facebook all the time, and it's like you really need to stop. Um, well, a former, former, uh, well, I should, uh, a person that I know on Facebook, all the time, political, 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 just hellacious, unloving, unchristian things toward president, towards yeah. whatever, and it's like, that is so ungodly, so ungodly. I don't care if you like the president or not. It is ungodly to post such things about on Facebook about anyone. And it's just like, wow. And you call yourself a Christian? I'm just, I'm, I'm perplexed by it. I'm not a member, so I don't, I don't, I just don't comment. Um, but it's just like, maybe I should, I, I guess. But Those people tend to get unfollowed. Regardless of what side, you know, yeah. you're on, because I, yeah. But it's that, it's that, just that causticness, right? We are not called to do that to people we know or people we don't know, uh, right? I, that's, I think, that's a very, very good one, Nancy, and I think it, it is so pervasive, um, and Christians really need to think two or three or four times before what comes out of their mouth or minds or fingers on the typewriter, typing board, type keyboard, that's what it's called, a keyboard, <laughs> typing board. <laughs> keyboard, <laughs> So, after spending the last, you know, week or so out in my garage, <clears throat> instead of writing a terse email or trashy Danny Olson on Facebook, I'm just gonna smack her on Sunday. There, there you go. That's that good. Be, yeah. I'm so glad that that is uh, on, <laughs> on the video camera now. Run her ideas. Danny had a great idea in my kitchen, and so Al is helping me uh, oh. custom custom build some new oh. kitchen cabinets. Oh, cool! So well, we had a good time. We really it has been a good time. I'm sorry. He's moving to Wyoming. I don't have too many yeah, more woodwork <laughs> opportunities <laughs> with the box. Maybe you can talk to him. There's still a few woodworking things that we talked about that you haven't done yet. You better remind me. In, in you better get in line. Uh, yeah, get in line. <laughs> He's got big plans. <laughs> like, the rail and the, the hey, ones on the other side. We talked about this over a year ago. Yeah, I think Mike is going to take it for now. That's a good idea because I have some extra oak over there that will make a chair rail all the way across here. Mike is Mike is better anyway. We'll just let him go. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, that one, thank you. <laughs> all right. What are some other... Hey, hey, we, we digress. This is not about Al. Um, we can talk about Al when he's gone. That's thing besides just the speaking. Um, so what what else be, besides the the uh, not not speaking typing what what other uh, what other ways what other practical ways what can we live meekly and gently um, understanding compassion forgiveness uh, don't uh, seek revenge you know forgive forgive um, uh, forgive especially when people aren't sorry right. That's that's a huge one, right? When um, to forgive somebody who actually isn't sorry will never be sorry. That that can be very difficult and challenging. Um, but uh, you said a couple more words. What were? Oh, just compassion. Compassion, right? To have compassion for somebody, um, to have compassion for an idiot rather than disdain, right? To have compassion for someone who says stupid things rather than. Um, I don't know, another word, disdain, um, right? Uh, I, I think that's a, that's a great, that's a great one too. Forgiveness and compassion um, are a couple of other ways to model that. How else can we model um, this living meekly and gently? When Christ was being accused, you know, all the way from the uh, Sanhedrin or whatever through Pilate, he didn't respond at all. Silence. I mean, in some cases, it was just silence. Some. Uh, that's a good one too. Because uh, sometimes that diffuses it. <coughs> they can't rile you up and, and 
get you. Well, sometimes it infuriates them. Just well, right. I mean, <laughs> silence isn't always isn't always the answer, or or it's not it's not like the permanent answer, right? Some sometimes you have to go yeah. back and say something, but but sometimes silence is is the thing to do. Let there be a, a diffusing kind of a period, uh, um, etc. I think going along with silence, um, maybe similarly when you mentioned Jesus and the Sanhedrin, etc. I mean, turning the other cheek yeah. too, right? Sometimes, sometimes as a Christian, uh, our meekness and gentleness in Christ simply calls us to take the abuse because because there's nothing that you can do. Uh, besides, get angry, retaliate, get revenge, right? All of those things, and those aren't those aren't what we're called to. So sometimes you just have to take the abuse, which um, sucks for as a, a as a human. That is very hard to do, <laughs> right? Terribly hard to do. Yeah, this is a whole this is a whole list of terribly hard to do things, right? <laughs> this is the this is the how does Jesus want us to. Um, live before others. And this whole list is a terribly hard to do um, list ultimately. In that way it's a lot like the Ten Commandments. I mean in, in a way it's like it's like the Ten Commandments. I mean this becomes this becomes really very specifically it becomes very specifically like fifth and eighth commandment. Right? The, I mean all of this stuff is really fifth and eighth commandment. How you deal before others. How you deal with others how you deal, um, how you present yourself to others, how you deal with the dysfunction that they bring into um, your realm, right? All of that. That's all fifth and eighth commandment stuff. Well, it's just, I mean, I, it was hard, obviously, in Paul's time, but it's hard in this time because if you're quiet and meek, you just get steamrolled mm -hmm. in yep. today's world. You just get steamrolled. There is no place for me, quiet people, really, if you're going to, I guess, get ahead at all. And, and I guess that's, we just have to remember that we don't have to strive to get ahead, but that's kind of inbred in us. Right. Work hard, study hard. Well, I think, I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, that's a really good, that's a really good observation to Sue. I, um... I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive, however, right? I mean, I think you can, I think you can be a, a strong leader. I think you can be a strong worker. I think you can, you can uh, uh, work hard to get promotions, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, and, and still be meek and humble and loving and kind and compassionate. To coworkers. Sure. Now, I think you are correct that it in, depends in, on what, in what some where in some realms, if you don't have a kill or be killed attitude, um, you may not succeed. However, then perhaps the Christian needs to find different Another employment, try, yeah. right? And that that also is hard because. <clears throat> Well, that's just hard, right? I mean, it's easy to say find another job. That's a hard. That's a hard thing to do, right? Well, you know, and, and I've read a lot of leadership stuff, and a lot of employees want a leader that cares and is compassionate. That's what they want. Now, whether the management recognizes. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's a talent in people and should be encouraged. I don't know. Well, we had a member. I had a member. I think I can share this. He shared this before. Trent Travis. Trent Travis had a job with an athletic company. I forget what it was called. But um, his boss was not a Christian and kind of expected business pra practices to not really be Christian. Uh, Trenton got to a point that he just couldn't do it, right? And, and it was kind of like, well, Okay, don't quit. You right. You have to support your family, so don't quit till you have something, right? If it gets really bad, I mean, I guess then you quit. But don't quit till you have something. But he was looking at changing jobs because he just couldn't do it. Um, and then the company got sold, and um, the new company brought in their people, and he got laid off, and 
then he became our capital campaign manager for a year and then found a new job. So <laughs> that was better than the one he had. That was better than the one he had, right? So all of that, right? It was, that's just a great story. I love that. But but he was, I mean, he really found it hard to be a Christian in that work environment. And, and in that case, then, the Christian probably needs to find another job. But, but again, that is a hard thing to do. Hard thing to do. Um, if you take that and carry that forward into the military, especially the senior leadership of the military, they have some nasty, nasty work they have to do. But I would much prefer having a Christian as a military leader than a non-Christian. Yeah. No, right. Right. I think so. Um, go back to Luther. If you must sin, sin boldly. Yeah. <laughs> I think the other, the the only other one that I had, um, you guys had a nice list there. Um, the only other one that I had was um, uh, that uh, in meekness and humbleness, right? We, we always need to consider others more important than ourselves, and so to set aside our wishes and our feelings uh, for the needs of others um, sometimes is. Uh, is necessary as we seek to live that humble and meek life that Christ calls us to. Number five, substitute other words for humble and bold to explain what Paul's true attitudes toward the Corinthians had been. So I guess he wants you to get out of thesaurus. Um, <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure this one's not in a thesaurus, Christ like. Um, humble. Yeah, really. I'm modest, unassuming, unpretentious, respectful, confident, self assured, courageous. You took a whole thesaurus, didn't you? I, that's both humble yeah. and bold. That's the humble yeah, you kind of did the humble and bold, right? right? And, and, and again, again, what uh, what the author is pointing out, and what Paul is pointing out, right, is when I'm face to face, I'm working with humility and meekness among you face to face. But but then in letter, I'm I'm kind of bold as I go through and uh, tell you tell you what. Um, what you should be doing and not be doing, right? And so, so that's what. Uh, so when Paul Paul had been there, right? Uh, some of those humble words that Mark just said. When he's writing, he's a little more strong, assertive, courageous um, kinds of words. Anybody have anything else? It's. I, it, I mean, it's not really a, you know um, something you find in the, the source, but for humble, it's could love. Oh, I think so, right? A, a loving attitude towards others, and and it's that loving attitude that puts others first, right? So it's not just I love you, but I love you enough to care for you, to put you first, to um, to see to your needs. Vicar, little yeah, boy in the back it, row. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting uh, that in verse two. It says, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness. Uh, I think that's just interesting that uh, he's hoping that when he goes there, they're just going to listen to him. Uh, and that he's not going to have to take the same kind of bold and even more I thought aggressive would be. Oh, uh, maybe okay. another good one. Aggressive, yeah. Um, it's like he doesn't have to get out of his teacher voice. Kind yeah. of strong, <laughs> strong, assertive, right? Yeah. He, he doesn't want to get out of his teacher voice. That's a really good. <laughs> that's a really good uh, analogy, Pam. I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think right when he uh, when he comes to them, he just wants them to have heard what he wrote, and so that when he comes, they are repentant. Yeah. So it's it's a. And, and actually, we get to that. We get to that in number. Wait for it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I skipped to two. Is, no. Not, well, you oh, did. You one. did skip to two, but it was. It it worked for what we were talking about. Um, I think he doesn't want his interaction to be based on the law when he gets there. Right, right. He doesn't want, he, he throws the law into the letter so that by the time he comes, they're repentant and, and ready to be Christ-like in their dealings so that they can reach out with the gospel. Yeah. 
I had firm and confrontational on that. I think, so. I think when Paul was writing them, writing to them from afar, I think it's like, look, folks, this is the way it is. And if it's any other way than this, your salvation's in question. Yes. I don't find what I'm thinking of. Huh. Well, we'll get to it, I assume. Yeah. Or I'm just wrong. All right, so, uh, verses 2 to 4. I beg you, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy strongholds. All right, when dealing with some of the accusations of his detractors, Paul had seemed conciliatory. He now takes them on boldly and forth. Really, Paul felt that he needed to do this. For, as we shall learn, these detractors were not merely attacking Paul with their accusations, but were really attacking the gospel itself. Paul addresses those who thought that Paul walked according to the flesh. What are some ways worldly approaches might be used in church work? So in the church, what um, this, this, uh, I don't understand, do you know this author sometimes, or the editor, probably the editor who picks challenge questions, honestly. This one, I think, is the challenge question. Because this one really makes you think about how do worldly influences come into the church in very specific ways. Not just sin, but, but what, are some of the, what are some of the worldly kinds of, 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 uh, of approaches, motivators, uh, things like that that happen, uh, that come into the church? Well, it becomes an entertainment. Oh, uh, golly, I didn't even have that. Uh, that's a good one. Entertainment. Um, oh, I like that a lot, Sue. Uh, no, I think that's uh, that's a great one, right? So that the Sunday morning event becomes an entertainment event. It's a concert. It's a, it's a uh, emotion-driven, um, and I might even put entertainment and emotion together, uh, although you can do emotions uh, in other ways in a worship service too. But, but the church becomes kind of an entertainment, emotive kind of a... Uh, kind of an activity as center, right, to bring bodies in, right? So, so you uh, have the neon flashing lights um, uh, come and have fun with Jesus on Sunday morning, right? So, uh, no, I think that's a that's a really good one. It's a really good one. What else? Inclusiveness. Um, go ahead, a little bit more. Inclusiveness, like there is no wrong. Um, we want to make sure you're a part of this, regardless of what you believe. All right, inclusive, inclusiveness, um, uh, truth doesn't matter. There's a spot for everyone at the table. That's what the... That's what the uh, spot for everyone at the table. Well, just lack of law and all, yeah, lack of preaching and with all. I took the questions in different ways what the church would have to do, like, yeah, that's how I to treat somebody. Do we have to provide <coughs> protection for them in like, the food and clothing? Yep, that's not what the question is asking. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, no. Uh, what are some worldly approaches? Some negative worldly What are some ways worldly approaches might be used in the church? Yes, so, so, uh, you mean if you're uh, walking worldly, the flesh? worldly approaches would be not biblical, uh, uh, godly, Christ-like approaches. So, so negative things. These are all negative kinds of things. Uh, worldly approaches would be sinful approaches. So what are some ways that sinful approaches of the world... Um, influence what the church does. So not the sinful and again not the sinfulness of members either. This is how do how do kind of these sinful things in the world, these worldly approaches, impact the church? How do they come into the church? And so I think two huge ones, right? 
secular humanism, and the uh, which is what we just, I mean, that's really the inclusiveness, truth doesn't matter, spot for everyone at the table, right? Secular humanism um, comes into the church, and the church has to act like the world in order to not drive people away, in order to <coughs> include people, in order to get more membership, all of that kind of stuff. So that so that we have this we have this secular humanist kind of idea that we have to change God's word to be inclusive. So homosexuality then isn't what it means today. And so homosexuals today, okay, not a problem. You can be included because Paul was talking about Jesus, uh, right? Old Testament was talking about something different. Well, that's just plain silliness. But it's the, it's the way that this worldly influence, this secular humanism, has, per, has come into the church. All right? And then I think Sue's idea of that entertainment mentality, right? Church was never, I mean, Jewish church, early Christian church, church all the way through, never had an entertainment kind of a mentality to it. It had problems and issues, right, all the way through. But this entertainment idea of the world is a very new thing. I mean, baby boomers, uh, this is the last 50 years, 60 years of Christianity that has been influenced by this uh, entertainment kind of mentality that has come in from the world. Right? Now, I wouldn't go as far as to say guitars are ungodly abominations and should never be used in church. There are some who would say that because right, the entertainment mentality is associated with the instruments. I think that's silly. I don't think entertainment, uh, we have to associate, um, uh, I'm entertained by the organ, right? I mean, I don't think we have to have to associate entertainment with the instruments being used. Um, but the, the entertainment mentality that this is why I'm coming to worship. I'm coming as a complete spectator to maybe sing along, maybe sing along with some jazzy songs that make me feel good, right? That's, I think that's a great example. There are some other ones. What are some other ways that kind of the world, the world um, influences the church? Well, opposite of inclusivism is being discriminatory with whom we share the gospel message. Um, I think, uh, uh, okay, so that's a good, I think that's a good one too. So um, racism, yeah. classism, uh, that's a, wow, that's, that's a good one too, Mark. I think racism, classism, um, uh, socioeconomicism. I, what's the word for so, that? So it's two extremes: inclusivism, discriminatory. No, yeah, I think so, right? So, so there are there are times that um, the church is very um, exclusive, and and that comes in from the world too, because the world is exclusive, right? And so um, uh, it it makes me. Uh, angry, it makes me angry when somebody like Mia Schreiner has told me in the past that <clears throat> there are there are members of Beautiful Savior that have made stupid, um, racist, or at least pseudo-racist comments um, in her presence. I'm just like, really? <laughs> just like, what? Right? I mean... Uh, uh, even at a church that's healthy like this, right, or that we would maybe mark as a rather healthy church, um, there is there is still some of that worldly influence of racism, classism, right? How would you feel if a poor, dirty old man came and sat next to you in church, right? Would you move down a chair? <clears throat> uh, or would you say hi and welcome him, right? And and we all would, well, of course I would say, I am welcome him now. I, 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 would you, right? Or would you move down the chair? Um, so no, that's a good one, Mark. I think racism, classism, um, economicism. Is there a word for that? What's yeah. the word? Anybody? No? Elitism or something, or something like that. I don't know. I feel like there should be an ism. Um, <clears throat> but I think those are all, those are very true. What What else? I have a couple others. Well, I like the Joel Osteen of 
approach. Hey, believe and you'll become wealthy. What's that? What do they call it? Oh, prosperity gospel. Yeah, prosperity yeah, that's gospel. pretty. That's a pretty good one too. You guys are coming up with a pretty good list. You know, one of the things that popped into my mind on the other side of this, though, how is how could the church? What are some worldly approaches that might be using the church for a positive? I don't want that yet. You can do that in a minute. I've got a couple more that are really rather that are okay. really rather pervasive, and and the Christian church doesn't do anything to help um, poor 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 theology um, drives uh, uh, this one. Um, pastors are simply hired and fired like any other job. The hiring and firing of pastors uh, like any other job. And, and even Lutherans who should know better sometimes have that mentality. You don't like your pastor? Well, let, how do we get rid of him? Let's fire him. Well, you can't fire him. Well, how do we get rid of him? Because we really want him gone, right? Yeah. Rather than saying, nope, he is the guy that the Lord has called to this place, that we have called to this place, and, and we are going to figure it out. Well, to go with that, just church shopping and people... I don't like. Oh my gosh, that's let's go that's night. awesome. Find the perfect you guys have situation. boy the uh, the Thursday night crowd has quite the challenge here because yeah. you guys have a uh, you guys have quite a list here. Block. <laughs> you know, yeah, because they didn't believe me enough for you. Yeah. Yeah. the converse of that is true when you talk about hiring and firing pastors because I've seen calls that were abandoned and it left a really oh really bad ab yeah them. absolutely I think that's I think that's exactly right right. Um, uh, Pastors who um, pastors who become um, lazy uh, in the in in what they've been called to do is kind of the opposite of that higher fire, right? Um, that that the pastor is well, I'm called and I uh, I don't have to work very hard. I don't have to do these things. Um, Jeanette Copeland told me that uh, uh, Jeanette Copeland. Jeanette Copeland told me that siblings, her mom, sibling, sibling has a pastor who refuses to make any shutting calls. Just doesn't make shutting calls. Any of them, ever. I'm like, oh, well, well, you need to tell your brother to bring the district in to bear on this because um, he is neglecting his call to the congregation. Hello? Um, it's like uh, the, he, your brother, as an elder, needs to call the circuit visitor immediately, right? Um, because, yeah, so I think that's very true, too, is that I think pastors can see um, what they do as a job, right? And then I can kind of neglect my job or not do what I don't want to do or pass it off to my elders, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's a good opposite of that one. I think the other one is just um, fear and guilt and shame uh, to motivate giving. Fear and guilt and shame to motivate getting people to serve on boards, right? Um, I mean, that's how the world motivates. The world motivates with fear and shame and guilt. Now, we did talk last week about motivating by the law, and, and you can't motivate by the law, but... Motivating by fear and guilt and shame is kind of the wrong use of the law, right? So motivating by the law is, God commands you to do this. Motivating by the law is, look, look at the faithfulness of others, right? That's motivate, That's proper motivating by the law. Fear and guilt and shame is not proper motivating by the law. All right? Um, now, yes, Vicar? Oh, I was just adding another one. Oh, go ahead. Uh, it's like the. Let's keep adding. I filled the space. I don't have any more. I, I have one more. I have room for one more. So this is. We talk about this one a lot at the seminary. Uh, it's like a therapeutic uh, idea of church, and so that you just come to church to uh, feel better. Um, like you go throughout your week, and then you feel really run down. And then you go to church, and you kind of get charged up, and then you go through your week again. Um, and that kind of church and God are just kind of uh, like a therapist. Yeah, like and you so you go there to get your problems fixed, and then you feel better, and then you get your problems fixed again. And then so sermons, sermons then really at times then become kind of feel good. 
uh, rah rah motivation. Yeah. Let me let me give you the weekly pep talk, mm -hmm. right? Becomes a weekly pep talk, which I think is a Joel Osteen esque kind of a thing. I mean, um, he's really trying to just give people a pep talk. This is how God wants you to live, rah rah. You'll be blessed, and uh, you leave here with a blessing because you've heard my weekly pep talk on on uh, what God wants for your life. Yeah, and this is really big because of uh, like the whole self-help. Oh, yeah. The whole self-love. Well, the whole... Um, um, a lot of people are into right now. Oh, so who's who's church yeah. kind of Nor uh, Norman Vincent Peale, right? And his power, power of Positive Thinking. Norman Vincent Peale and his Power of Positive Thinking. That's maybe waned a little bit. 20 years ago, Norman Vincent Peale was really popular. Anybody familiar? I read that book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and then, and then, I mean, you can, you can get, there's actually, I mean, there's like a little monthly digest of, of stories and motivational things. And guideposts? Say it again. Guideposts. My mom gets that. Guideposts. That's what it is. Yes. Um, so, in it, in and of itself, a lot of that is benign, and some of it's really true, right? But but it's not what the church is, right? So I'm not just trash. I'm not just trashing guideposts and and the concept of Norman Vincent Peale. But if if it's only that, life becomes shallow and hollow and meaningless because you can't attain those things, right? So so that's. Church can't become that because church is where you're grounded in, in the work of the Holy Spirit. So that when you read something about the power of positive thinking, you can apply it to your Christian life, all right? So that's... that's or, or not apply it. Or not apply it, right? Or not apply it, that's correct. So, so I'm not just trashing that. I'm not saying get that out of your mom's house. But, but it has to be <laughs> grounded... It has to be grounded in the Word and in the work of the Spirit or get it out of the house, right? I mean, because, and then definitely keep it out of the church because that's not what... It's not the role of the church. It's not to make you feel better. It's not the role of the church to make you feel better. But there's, the, the, once you do come out of the service feeling re-energized, I don't think there's anything wrong with absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. You but it's not... Good. But it's not the it's not the not purpose the of the right. church, right? right? The purpose the purpose is <clears throat> the gospel, right? The purpose right. is make you see your sin through the law and forgive you in the gospel. And if that doesn't make you feel good, there's something wrong with you, right? Um, I always wonder about the people who walk back from communion with dour expressions on their face, like nothing good just happened, right? But I can't judge their hearts because I don't know. But I'm just like. Hmm. You ever considered smiling after receiving the absolution, after receiving the Lord's Supper, after hearing the sermon, right? I mean, are, are these things good for your soul or not? You want to start high-fiving? No, but... <laughs> hey, I high-five. I high-five, like, yeah. more and more kids coming out of church. I try to have people on the shoulder sometimes and smile when I'm coming back that, you know, like, that are either in my zone or... And they looked up and make eye contact with me and stuff like that. But you're talking about the, the somber thing. We used to play a game when I was in Walter Lee called This is a Very Solemn Occasion. And you were kind of, I'm a lot older than you, so I grew up in a church where you were <coughs> coming back from communion. German Lutherans. Yeah, That's funny. Yeah. Well, some of it is, you know, you probably are still. It's also right. Contemplating. I, and that's why I I will not judge people. I will not judge people uh, because I don't know their hearts. Because some people may still be praying. Some people may be headed back to their seats in order to pray. Right. So so no, absolutely correct. Um, but but you're right. I think you're right, Sue. Is is that uh, absolutely? You should be leaving church feeling better, relieved, joyful. Um, invigorated, ready for the week ahead, right? Empowered to speak um, of Jesus to others, right? All of those things should happen um, as a result of why church exists. Right? My right. sister said to me once, the one that died here recently, it just, she had a very hectic life. She just had a lot of responsibilities and her week was always hectic. But she went to church, she came out 
calmer, relaxed. She yep. was given that strength and power to <laughs> face the next week because yep. it, that's just the way her life was. I always yep. felt like I was a teacup that by the time when I, when I first started going back to church, it was it, it just sort of helped me face my week and everything that was going on yep. by what happened Sunday morning. I mean, that wasn't why they were there. It's it incidental. But, it's but, incidental but, to but, what church is, right? It's, 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 it was necessary. If I missed church, I was depressed that week. Yep. It's an, it, it, it is the... Uh, it is the uh, natural outcome of the forgiveness of sins, right? That's what you're talking about. The purpose of church, though, is to forgive sins, right. not make you feel better. But but the natural outcome of forgiveness is... You feel better. You feel, you feel pretty <laughs> darn good, right? Well, hearing the message, you know, yes, forgiveness of sins, but you also hear a message that... Maybe helps you. Hit the point. <laughs> exactly right. Again, again, that's... Right, the proclamation of the gospel and the and the natural outcome of that, right? So, yeah, I've had all kinds of people walk out of church from time to time and say, "Wow, thanks for that sermon. That really helped me." You know, da da da. And they were coming out of church, they don't get into how specifically, but but that's I mean that's awesome. That's that should be kind of the natural outcome of the gospel is that we are helped, enlivened, um, uh, joyful. Um, uh, all of those kinds of things, uh, recharged, reinvigorated, um, uh, 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 encouraged. Uh, uh, what's it called when you? Uh, 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 I don't know. Get somebody a job. Um, directed, right? I mean, I think there's all kinds of outcomes um, that the gospel brings. At Christ and Flatwoods, we had a sign over the entry to the sanctuary that said, Be still and know that I am God. And I love that so much because what it meant to me was, Check your worries and carries here. You're going in there. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, uh, the the going out, the plaque should say, uh, So be still and know that I am God. Um, uh, buckle up as you leave, right? <laughs> buckle up. Uh, that would be a good that would be a good sign leaving the church. <laughs> Uh, that, would be, that would be great. Again. That would be great. That's a, that is like a new great idea. Be still and know that I'm God on your way in. Buckle up on your way out. Anybody would take it to me to put their seatbelts in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Nancy, for just crushing me. All right. Number seven. Number seven. Think of some of your own Christian standards that are in conflict with the standards of the world around you. List several of these standards below. Um, so I have sexual morality. Uh, it's just so like different from our Christian standards today. Marriage is so different from our Christian standards today. Value of human life is so different from our standards today. What else do you have? I had those. <laughs> Any more? Love for simple. a fellow man. Oh, all right. Our yeah. love for others, that's a good one. And our expectations for the behavior of our leaders. Oh, and you know what? That's not just our leaders, honestly. That's expectation of behavior for anybody. I think I think you should have some serious expectations of behaviors for your kids, right? How many people in the world have any expectations of behaviors for their kids? I mean, some, but but I mean that's just radically radically all over the place. I'm like, you let your kids do that? Are, are you are you? Stupid? I, I don't know. just really I, low expectations. Huh? Yeah. Expectations are very low, yeah. Um, any others on your list? What about individual rights and freedoms? Oh, individual rights and freedoms. Vicar just mentioned this the other day. Where uh, where yeah. were we that you... Uh, I think we were was in it? the council meeting. In our council meeting. Yeah, we were talking about the 6th, uh, 7th, uh, six, six, and 8th yeah. commandments. Yeah. And uh, Vicar mentioned that Dr. Bierman says at the seminary says all the time that um, really, really we have no rights. There, there isn't a biblical, there is no biblical understanding of rights. Isn't that fascinating? So we live in a country where our constitution says that we have certain unalienable rights. 
that that's actually probably wrong. Yeah. Arguably wrong. From a human, from an earthly standpoint, that's the mentality. But that's so so Nancy, that's a really good that's a really good answer. Um, uh, say what you said again though. It's your individual rights and oh. freedoms. Rights and freedoms. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Well like Professor Beerman that one uh, special talk he did on the church versus state, you know, talked about our founding fathers, they weren't necessarily Christian. They were these Masons and they were deists. They were deists. Yep. And that's why they created this country to be a bunch of individual right people. And yeah. that's what we are. Right? Because because right. because a deist a deist yeah. would say, I have rights yeah. because I'm a human. Right? I have rights because I'm a human. And because like, you're created. Because I'm created. Yeah. Because God created me, I have rights. <clears throat> Um, he does not give. He gives uh, Adam. He gives Adam jobs in the garden. He doesn't give him any rights. He gives him dominion, though. Over. Right. That's a job, though. Yeah. It's a job, right? That's I mean, right. it's really, a, it's really a job. It's really a job. Um, you uh, here. Uh, uh, I think here. Here's a great example. One of the rights that our Constitution gives is the freedom of speech. You don't have the freedom of speech if you say something that's ungodly. You do not have the freedom of speech. There is no right to a freedom of speech in the Bible. Your words should be godly and kind and loving and compassionate and affirming. You don't have the freedom of speech in the Bible. Where is that at? And the world just rolls their eyes in the bedroom. Let's, rock, let's rock the whole Constitution this morning, right? <laughs> politics, this is why, the older I get, the older I get, the less politics matter to me. Let's just the less politics matter. Because, because our world has so many things so wrong. If you have, so if you have democracy, you have to have rights. I, I, if, if you're, you're going to have a democracy, democracy you, you have to have things. some rights built in, right? If you have a monarchy, then you don't yeah, need rights. Yeah, that's part of the state, yeah. though. That's, you know. I know. But if you just think about that, right? What, what, is it, what, is it about, um, what is it about being a Christian that gives you the right to say anything you want? It doesn't. But our Constitution says you have the right to say anything you want. But even that's impinged because you can't say things now that make people feel bad. Which is a good thing. Which is a good thing. It's it's a little more godly. It's a little yes. more godly than than saying anything, right? I mean, that matches that matches what we would say as Christians a little bit better. Well, that's why I don't like the term political correctness. You know, it's you know, nope. I understand it's gone too far, but not saying things that are derogatory towards someone is a is a, feel good is a good thing. is a good thing. Nope, that's so, exactly right. Nope. Say that's true political correct when you're not saying something that's gonna rub someone wrong. You shouldn't try to purposely. I mean, it's exactly right. You're right. So correct. But again, but again, right? So, so as a Christian, as a Christian, it would be better to um, understand how a Christian should speak uh, to others uh, and not really worry that we have a right to freedom of speech, right? Uh, because ultimately, you don't have a right to freedom of speech. You have you have the responsibility to speak like Christ. That's like Luther said, put the best construction on everything. Yeah. And God gives the government say. all the authority. You're under the government, and so whatever the government wants to give you, you have to accept. Absol absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying that we just throw away the Constitution because God gives the government the authority to write the Constitution, mm -hmm. and that's they put that in there, but just because it's in there, right, we speak like Christ. We don't, as Christians, necessarily have the right to say whatever we want. Regardless of what the government says, we don't have the right to say whatever we want because we're Christians. Um, so number eight, the following two passages listed here refer to instances when Paul was clearly no, no long-distance hero and up close coward. Briefly describe Paul's actions in these instances. So in Acts 15, 1 and 2, what does he do? There was a dissension and confronting heresy. 
Uh, yeah, so, so, distinction like a conflict so, so he strongly opposes the circumcision party that is saying, hey, to be a Christian, you have to be circumcised. And Paul's like, what the nut are you people talking about? And he confronts that head on and says, absolutely, you do not need to be circumcised. And then later on in Acts, he explains even more that ultimately... Um, uh, circumcision pointed ahead toward um, baptism. All right. um, and then uh, in Galatians, I just, the, uh, took on Peter regarding hypocritical conduct regarding the Jewish laws yeah. must be kept to be saved. So, so Peter, Peter would, and the the specific controversy here is Peter would eat with Gentiles, Gentile Christians until Jewish Christians showed up, and then he would eat with the Jewish Christians. And Paul's like, what are you doing? <laughs> right? Um, because Paul, Paul is, or Peter, Peter is trying to look good uh, in front of the more influential Jewish Christians, uh, I, I, mean, I suppose. That points back to when he, you know, said he didn't know Christ, when he was with the people in the what do you wear? The garden or whatever. Right. Yeah, he wanted. He. <coughs> yeah. It's that. It's that denial of. Uh, yeah. Um, so so uh, Paul confronts him and uh, and Peter repents and um, and recognizes uh, what he was doing. Uh, challenge question. Think about the opposition that Paul faced in Corinth. How were his opponents waging war against Paul with worldly means? I feel like I'm not sure I, how that is so challenging. They were trying to undermine him. Yeah, yeah, right. Anyway, Unfounded either. accusations, character assassination, gossip, self promotion. Right? They were puffing themselves up. I mean, I, I. Uh, that's what they. Uh, right. That's what they want to do. I don't know why that's a challenge question. Yeah. I think the editor. Um, we've had this actually several times. The yeah. challenge questions and the personal reflection questions were not picked well. And my guess is that those are all editorial, right? So somebody reading through the study probably said, well, that's really challenging for <laughs> me. <laughs> right? um, but it's like, well, okay. I don't know why that's challenging, but it's okay. Um, so, yeah, and I think that's kind of, I mean, we've been there, done that, right? That's That's... What his detractors were saying. We've kind of done that a couple of times already in the Second Corinthians. Um, read Ephesians six. What weapons did Paul rely on contending, uh, contending for the gospel? Of, upon in contending for the gospel. Truth. Well, yeah, truth. Right. Righteousness. Faith. Peace. Peace, peace with Christ. Help. Salvation. Assurance of salvation. Shield. Shield of faith, sword of the spirit, which is the word of, God. word of God, right? Word of God and prayer, right? So truth, righteousness, peace of Christ. But is that all under the faith. armor of God? Huh? All those things under yeah. the armor yeah. of God? Yeah. The uppers. So you could have just convinced. You yeah. could have. Yeah. So did Nancy, so did Nancy write armor, full armor? I did. Armor. And then I to <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is correct. Uh, your author wanted you to note, right? So, so instead of just saying, right, um, the helmet of salvation. Well, what what does that mean, right? Well, it's the assurance of salvation. The assurance of salvation, right? So if you just said the helmet of salvation, well, what is that? What does that mean? Uh, well, it's the assurance of salvation that I go into battle with, right? Um, uh, it, I don't go into battle with the sword of the spirit. What's the sword of? I, I go into battle with the word of God, right? That's what the the, the uh, author kind of wanted you to flesh that out a little bit more. The uh, the the what is it? The uh, feet? No feet. Shoes for readiness. Of the gospel of peace, right? Well, what the heck is that? Well, it's that peace of Christ that we have, right? That's that's what it's talking about, the peace of Christ. Um, truth is truth, truth of God's word. Righteousness is that right standing with God, right? Um, but a couple of those, they just 
you wanted you to flesh out a little bit. And then who are we ultimate, who's, who's ultimately the uh, opponent of the gospel? Satan, uh, Satan right, devil. Um, what are the weapons Paul mentions uh, capable of doing? Destroying arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Yeah, right. So, so this is what we have. This is what we have to destroy um, false arguments, um, false opinions about the Word of God. Right. So, one of my favorite. One of my favorite. Uh, I uh, I used to argue scripture a lot with people. I mean, when I was younger and dumber. Um, now. Now when people tell me things or say things um, to me, I simply say, show me. Show me where the Bible says that. That's my challenge. I don't need to argue. I don't need to whatever. Just, just show me. Show me where the Bible says that. And if you can't show me where the Bible says that, then you're not right on this point. Right? So just show me where the Bible says that. That's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite ways of destroying kind of these false arguments and um, false opinions, right? Just show show me where God's word says that. And the common table prayers in Matthew. That's exactly correct. Exactly correct. I had uh, Al brings up this. Um, we uh, went fishing with uh, Vicar Hoffman. And uh, I don't know what we were talking about, but I was sitting on the couch, um, uh, sipping on a uh, glass of Crown Royal, and um, somebody said something, I don't remember, and uh, I, think, I think Al or George or somebody said something about common table prayer and the other prayer that the Lord taught us or something like that, and uh, Vicar was like, what are you guys talking about? I was like, yeah, the common table prayer. It's like, I don't know, Matthew 6, 7, I don't know, something like that. The, uh, the, uh, this is a good lesson from your pastor. Um, a convincing lie is born out of ambiguity. So if you want to convince somebody of something, don't be overly certain. And never be overly certain. Isn't that great from your pastor? And that's <laughs> not, that's <laughs> not wrong. That's how you make a convincing lie. Just don't be don't be certain about it. So it's it's uh, so I, I had him convinced it was in the Bible. <laughs> convinced in the red that the common table uh, prayer was in the Bible. Um, in the red print. That was so funny. So funny. Um, all right. So day three, Second uh, Corinthians ten five and six. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your disobedience is complete. Yeah. When your yeah. obedience is complete. <laughs> when your obedience yeah. is complete. Yeah, that was kind of important. <laughs> that is a, that is a, uh, that really changes what the, what the yeah. Bible says, doesn't it? All right, so know what Paul is saying in verse 5. In following this course, <clears throat> how is Paul following the example of Jesus? All right, so we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. What, what's Paul, what's the knowledge of God? You have to have this to understand what he's talking about. It's the Holy Spirit uh, You're maybe, by the yeah, Holy sure, right, uh-huh. Where does the not, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, Nancy. Well, um, I, I don't disagree with you, you're completely right and wrong. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, no, you usually say great things, but it's like, uh, you're just, you know, left of the target. Um. Uh, Jesus. So even more specifically, where does the knowledge of God come from? God's word. God's word. Yes, Vicar. Is it just the cross? Yeah. Well, okay. So ultimately, then it's the cross, right? And then where is the cross revealed? The foolishness of man. 
God. Yeah, it it's all revealed though <clears throat> in God's word. And so so what your uh, uh, because in Luke four we have what the temptation. temptation of Jesus. Right. And how did Jesus thwart the Satan? He just quoted quoted scripture. So what what your author is doing is pointing out that Jesus quoting scripture is the same thing as Paul talking about the knowledge of God, right? This is scripture. So, so uh, I think, I, and I think your author is correct. We can equate the knowledge of God not with a, um, I think just the Holy Spirit in your heart is a little more am, ambiguous, right? So I think this is the knowledge of God, not the knowledge that he puts into our heart and mind through the work of the Holy Spirit, but the knowledge that's there, that's put there from Holy Scripture. I think that's what your author is saying. So, what so Holy Scripture is he talking about? Say it again. What, what scriptures is he talking about? Well, what, what scripture would Paul be talking about? That's a great, that's a great question. He'd be talking about the Old Testament. Okay. Maybe, maybe the Gospels mm. or the Gospels that have been written. It's probably not talking about the Old Testament. Why would he, people be making arguments against the Old Testament? He might not be talking about the Old Testament either. It might be, it, it actually might even be, so that's a really good point, Vicar. Um, it might even be the knowledge of God through the Apostles and through the Apostolic work at this point. And some of that could be referenced to what's been written down from the gospel writers, from Paul, from Peter, right? That that there are there is work, there is this knowledge of God um, through the work of the apostles already being circulated, right? No, you're probably right. It's probably not the Old Testament, right? So, and this is why he doesn't say scriptures yeah. because in other places. In other places, Paul would say, like the scriptures say. Mm. Oh, very good. That's a very good point, Vicar. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. So Paul says, knowledge of Christ. <clears throat> but the knowledge of Christ is, right, that apostolic teaching of Christ and the cross, which becomes scripture um, at, at some point in the near future, right? So, but but I think that's the that's the equation, right? It's God's word spoken by the apostles. Jesus is quoting God's word from the Old Testament. It's God's word is what combats Satan. The scary thing about this is Satan was also quoting scripture. <clears throat> yes, quoting, misquoting, but misquoting, misquoting right? Scripture. And and so and so this is why I ask people to show me where it says that. Yeah. Well, I mean, in right. several places, so, he does he does quote the Old Testament. So when the when the pair of Jehovah's Witnesses sat in my house, and I said I said, well, Jesus, um, they pick up stones. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. He invokes the name Yahweh. That's the Old Testament name Yahweh or Jehovah in your parlance, um, is what I said to them. But he invokes the Old Testament name of God, Yahweh. He calls himself Yahweh. And they pick up stones to stone him. And the pair of Jehovah's Witnesses said, well, that's just what they thought he meant. It's like, sh sh show me in the scripture, because that's not what it says. Show me what it says. Show me that it says this is what they thought. This is what they knew he proclaimed, right? So, so if you're going to misquote scripture, sh show me why you are interpreting it correctly, right? Show me. Show me why that's right. That's right? what the Missouri Synod. I think it's a very powerful show I think it's a power powerful way of of doing that because you can't um, Satan misquotes scripture and Jesus just quashes it with the correct quotation of scripture or the correct usage of scripture. So so don't don't misquote scripture. It, it's what what is the knowledge of God? And don't this take scripture out of context either. And don't take it out of context because that's not the knowledge of God either. Misquoting and taking out of context isn't the, the true knowledge of God. Right? So, so Paul, um, Paul is talking about the knowledge of God. That's a, 
I, I, I need to amend that, Vicar, because you're right. This isn't uh, the knowledge of God would be the apostolic teaching. Or and like I the, said, uh, perhaps the written gospels. I, we said on uh, wasn't it wasn't it this past Sunday? Um, we mentioned that uh, was it Sunday? It was somewhere. Dang it, I forget what we were reading. We were reading something, and it was fairly obvious that the uh, that Paul what Paul that the epistle writer, whoever it was, was quoting like probably one of the gospels, which had been written twenty years before the epistle was being written. And as like uh, well, well, it's pretty. It's, it seems pretty obvious that that the uh, epistle writer was was familiar with whichever gospel. Anybody remember that? I do. But I talked about that. Kind of like a Paul. Vicar, mm -hmm. what were you gonna say? So uh, I think it's not. Uh, I think it's also important to think that it's not the scripture because, uh, especially because of the people had faith with that before the Bible. Absolutely. And so we don't just follow the yeah. Bible because it's. Bible, but we follow the Bible because it goes along with because it's what God faith. says, right? Well, right. faith, that's, yeah, and that's why we're not Bible believing Christians, right? Yeah. When when Baptists or whoever say, you know, we're Bible believing Christians, it's like, nope, take take the Bible away. Our faith is not in the Bible. Our faith is in the Word of God. I think, yeah, it's like the paradosis. That's the that's the theological term for the. It's like the Christian teaching coming down from the disciples yes. to us. Yes. And so that's why uh, we decide what books are in the Bible and what books aren't in the Bible because they go along with the paradosis. Yeah. Yeah. What's been passed down. Yeah. All right. The letter B. Jesus and Paul used the same weapon. Why is this weapon so effective? Because it never changes. Huh? Because it doesn't change. It's active truth. It's alive and active. What number is this? This is a letter B. Okay. I just got to swear we were at. What else? It discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It what? It discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Yeah, right. It, it's the sword. It's the sword of the spirit that penetrates the heart, um, the inner thoughts and motives of a person. for that musical interlude. Excellent. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, uh, it's, that, it's that sword of the spirit that penetrates the hearts, the thoughts, and motives of a person. Good. Um, number 12, challenge question. While Paul intends to punish the acts of disobedience in Corinth, note what he expects the believers to do in the meantime. Why is this important? So, yeah, so Paul is... Uh, Paul seems to uh, be ready to punish every disobedience when he comes, right? He's, he's going to come. I, I, don't, I really want to know how the heck he punished disobedience when he came. I'm fascinated by that, um, by that thought, right? What, what is it that Paul brings to bear in terms of punishment? Um, I wonder if they excommunicated. I, I wonder if he came and excommunicated uh, people from the Corinthian congregation and said, and said, mean, you you have to separate yourselves from these people, right? I mean, is that the? That well, he does talk about he does talk about um, being separate from the the guy who uh, uh, has relations with his um, stepmother, right? He's saying exclude and separate yourselves from them. So yeah, I mean, I kind of wonder if if that's the punishment that's coming, right? Um, it's an interesting thing. But what, what do they do in the meantime? They need to repent and be obedient. Yeah, uh, be obedient to Christ. So accept and submit to Paul's apostolic authority and, and escape sin's dangers then through repentance and faith. So is this kind of oh, an ultimatum? Because I'm coming to deal with the disobedience, so get your act together before I get there. It's an interesting... That's an interesting... Uh, uh, way to put it. Um, yes, it is probably, it, you could probably definitely see it as um, more law, right? You, you want to repent, 
and be obedient to Christ until I come. Right? Um, be, because when I come, the disobedient are going to be punished. I, I think so, right? And that's, that's law, right? I mean, it's the threat of law that the disobedient are going to be punished. But, but Paul has made a lot of gospel pleas also, right? So, so it's not just a law plea, be disobedient so you don't get punished. No, I mean, be obedient so you don't get punished. No, be obedient because this is what Christ calls you to, right? Mm -hmm. And remain obedient to Christ. When I come, the disobedient are going to be punished. So yeah, I mean, I think you could definitely see that as, as definitely, I mean, it's definitely a law statement, but it's not, the motivation to be obedient isn't because the disobedient get punished, right? Um, your children might behave that way sometimes. It's not the correct motivator, right? I don't want my children to be obedient because if they're not, they get punished, right? I want them to be obedient because you're part of the family. We love each other. We help each other. We care for each other. That's why you need to be obedient. So be obedient, but understand, yeah. if you're not, you're going to get punished. Yeah, I don't know if it really shows intention to punish. I think it just says that you... It, agreed. It's ambiguous. Uh, your author, your author takes it to show kind of an intention to be punished. When I read it, I agree. It's not necessarily an intention. It's ambiguous. We can translate it as we are ready to. So it's like if we need to, we are ready to. Yes. But I don't know if it's really intention. Yeah, I don't know. Um, my guess though is that he did come and deal with. The false teachers somehow, some way, or at the very least, empowered the church when he got there to deal with them in the future, right? I mean, yeah. I, I would, I would just think pragmatically, pragmatically, they have to be dealt with by more than just Paul's letter, right? Especially if they're part of the congregation. If these are, if these are people that they've raised up as pastors, for instance. Um, they're going to need to be dealt with. They either need one-on-one -on -one confession and absolution with Paul, or they need to be excised from the Christian church. So, so I would agree, Vicar, that it's not necessarily that this verse, to base intent on this verse is difficult. But pragmatically, I assume Paul had to do something. So what do you think that the second part of... Uh, that last clause in, or in six. What do you think that has to do with it? Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Because that doesn't really seem to fit with the rest of the... I know. The sentence. Because five and six are it's one sentence. And so I, I up assume... until then it's like he's talking about himself and his own... Or the apostles, well, himself and... We destroy the arguments of every lofty person raised against the knowledge of God and take every, right, which would be apostolic teaching, uh, and take every thought captive um, to obey Christ. Being ready to punish every... Well, it's the same sentence, though. I know. Yeah. Uh, being ready to, to punish every... So, uh, every thought captive to obey... To obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So I think what that is saying is um, what the author kind of points to. So you are obedient, and then the rest get dealt with. So when your obedience is complete, so when so right now I'm writing this letter to do what? To call you readers to repentance and faith and obedience in Christ. That letter is going to do its work, and then, if we still need to, we'll deal with the remnants. We'll deal with the disobedient. So when your obedience is complete, Al still isn't, Nancy still isn't, right? But everybody else's obedience is complete. So we're going to deal with Al and Nancy separately, separately because they're still disobedient. I think that's what it's saying. Yeah, and the important part was to get them. To repent, yeah, and become so obedient to Christ. Right. Again. So, so 
um, we destroy arguments and every lofty right. opinion raised against the knowledge of God. So, you either hold to apostolic teaching, or you're part of the uh, arguments and lofty opinions raised by the false teachers. Right? So, it, but if you're going to hold to the apostolic teaching, then repent and turn to obedience and faith, and then the disobedient are going to need to be dealt with. And, and Paul's ambiguous as to how the disobedient are going to be dealt with. That's how I would read that unless the Greek shows something different. And honestly, I didn't look it up in a commentary to see, but I think that's, that's what it, and, and the ESV notes don't help. Um, huh? I thought it said once Paul is sure of the Corinthians' obedience to Christ, he will go after the third party. Where is that at? In verse in five? Verse six. 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 The note for verse six. Oh, there. I was looking at verse five. I was talking about the. Once well, Paul, well, well, Paul is sure of the Corinthian obedience to Christ, the priority was the to get them back to obedience. Yeah. That's his first priority. He'll, then he'll deal with those that don't want to. Troublemakers. It's yeah. like the old, the old saying in the armor shoot the, first, shoot the closest tank. <laughs> yeah. Like, yes. Uh, one of the questions I have, though, is when he talks about these acts of disobedience, are we talking about the super apostles, or are we talking about the purveyors of immorality within the church itself? It is everybody who is not holding to the apostolic So it's both of them. The apostolic it's teaching. both groups. It's everybody who is speaking against the word, or speaking or acting against the knowledge of God. So it's both of them. I think so. I think so. I think it's... Is all encompassing. Now, in this section, in this section, he is specifically talking about his detractors, which would be the false teachers, right? I mean, he is being pretty specific here, but I think in the larger context of Second Corinthians and even really First Corinthians, I, I think I think you have to say it's everybody who is acting against that. Dang it! What's the word? Knowledge of God. I want, to, I want to use that word, knowledge of God, right? All right. Um, so again, I really didn't see, I really didn't see twelve as a challenge question. Uh, we dove a little deeper on it, but I don't, I don't, I think, I think it's that be obedient to Christ. It's. Um, 13, personal reflection. I'm not sure that this is really very personal either. Paul writes of taking every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. This can be difficult to do, especially when we read in the Bible or hear in a sermon that we are wrong and have sinned. Uh, when this happens, what does your Lord want your response to be? Change churches. <laughs> So bad. Wow. Be contrite. Yep. Yeah, that's why they're moving yeah. to Wyoming. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> move, move to Wyoming. They can have you. A broken and contrite heart and repentance. All right. Yeah. Uh, again, it's really um, thirteen. Is really thirteen. Is really our response. 12 is what Paul wanted of the Corinthians, but 13 is what Paul wants of us as we read that same verse, right? Um, when the law condemns, take it seriously, recognize your sin, confess, repent, um, receive forgiveness, and then seek to amend our life with the Holy Spirit. It's that whole sin grace wheel that you've seen me draw before, right? It's that whole, it's that whole thing, right? That's, that's what Paul wants of the Corinthians. Now, what, that's what Paul wants of us. That is, that is seeking to live obediently. It doesn't mean that we won't sin, but, but it's, it's that sin, repent, try to change, sin, repent, try to change cycle. And, and I suppose also sort of the... Uh, um, I'll leave it at that. All right, day four, 2 Corinthians 10, 7 to 11. <clears throat> Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much, 
of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. All right. Apparently Paul's opponents were claiming this, uh, a superiority over Paul, saying they belong to Christ and implying that Paul didn't. Paul cites his authority once again and asserts that the Lord gave it to him for a specific purpose. What's that purpose? Well, for building up the Corinthians, not to destroy them. Building up the church, right? Building up the church. And, and I, I mean, you're not wrong, Nancy, because building up the church has the, um, uh, the intended result, then, of spreading the gospel, right? Um, if the church is weak, if the church is sick, if the church is, is uh, fraught with difficulties and problems, if the church is mired in sin, if the church is, is uh, mired in false teaching then the work of the gospel is not going to happen. Right? Work of the gospel is not going to happen. If, if the uh, church is completely self-centered and uh, only looks to their own cares and needs and wants and desires, the work of the gospel isn't going to happen. Right? The church becomes a country club. Right? All of these things, whether the church is a country club or the church is mired in false doctrine or the church is mired in um, problems, Right? The work of the gospel can't take place. It's just not going to. Yeah, okay, so we collect some things for social ministry, um, but the work of the gospel is not going to take place. It just isn't going to happen. People aren't going to speak of Jesus when they leave the place, right? Um, uh, there's going to be no uh, vision for any mission outside of these walls, etc., etc. What do you find in the following references that will be helpful to you in building up the church by building up your fellow Christians in their faith? Romans 15. I said build up, build up the weak because that will help their faith. All right, help, help people grow beyond their weaknesses. That's good. I think go, to take that one step further, I think it's the strong are obligated, we have a responsibility to help the weak. We have a responsibility to help the weak. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's exactly correct. And, and if you think about that, um, uh, that can be done with encouragement and love and patience and kindness. Sometimes it has to um, be done with some law, right? And um, the weak need to see their sin and repent and and seek to do better. So, um, yeah, and I think I think uh, those who are strong in faith have an opportunity and an obligation to help the weak. Um, second Corinthians, or uh, second, no, Colossians two, dyslexic today, I guess. Uh, Colossians two. You said you remain in God's word. Right? All right, remain in God's word ourselves, right? Um, seek to grow in an ever closer relationship with God, right? How can you help others if you, know. you aren't strong in the faith? Good. First Corinthians 14. <laughs> Excel in building up the church. Uh, how? I put use your spirit, spiritual gifts. Yeah, the desire to use your um, gifts, your spirit-given gifts, for the common good, for building up the church. Um, number 16, Paul's opponents charged that he was forceful from a distance through his letters, but then, but that forcefulness melted away uh, when face to face. What do you think? Oh, excuse me, keep me awake. What do you think? I know, Kelly, you guys are really boring, I guess. <laughs> um, what do you think such a charge reveals about the one making the charge? They were afraid. They were what? They were afraid, weren't they? And kind of ignorant. Not kind of, they were. Okay. Probably, 
probably some, um, probably some of that. What else is is perhaps going on with I think these they guys? They were only looking at the outside. All right, they were only looking at the outside. Okay. They don't, they don't know Christ. They don't, they're not reflecting Him. Not reflecting Christ. Good. Yeah. They uh -huh. had doubts about. They knew when He was speaking the truth, and they had doubts about what they had hung their hat on. Well, that's an interesting. That's an interesting thought. Um, uh, they heard what Paul was saying, and then, um, are we really proclaiming the right things? Yeah, we don't know. We don't know that for sure. But that's a fascinating. That's a fascinating. Uh, fascinating idea. Um, that that probably bears some thought and some merit, right? They. They may well be wondering if they're on the right side of things. And, and if you wonder if you're on the right side of things, it's easier to do what? It's easier to attack and criticize than to repent and come over. Right? I mean, I think, I think we saw this in the, uh, well, I think we saw it in the Senate of Kansas here this past week yeah. when they voted down the Life Amendment. Um, because I think I think there are people who know that they are on the wrong side, but it's easier to dig in your heels and make it a political issue than to they didn't want to give up their political office than to do that's what would have probably yeah it's, they so probably would have lost out right and so it's uh, it's easier to um, attack and criticize yeah it's a, that's a that's a golly that's an interesting thought Sue I think I, I mean you could. That could definitely have some merit in what they were thinking. What what else are they more concerned with than anything else? Well, I put I put though that they're they're doing they're being guilty of the same thing that they were accusing Paul of that they are only strong when not facing the person making the charge oh. against them, who is Paul. That's interesting. Yeah, I have, um, and we don't know. Again, that's sort of an argument from silence, right? But but they seem to be really strong when Paul's not around. Yeah. I wonder what they were like when Paul oh, showed up, not. right? Those would those would be fascinating conversations to have recorded, right? What did Paul say to the to the League of False Teachers? Yeah. Right? What what actually did happen after the Corinthians repented, turned back to Christ, and then dealt with the false teachers among them, right? Where did they repent? Were they uh, uh, even more incensed and angered? Were they, right? Uh, that's a fascinating, yeah. fascinating question. Based on that question right there, what Sue said earlier, I see some parallels from between the Pharisees and Christ in the temple. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. This is this is uh, these are these are pastors, self-proclaimed apostles, um, self-proclaimed prophets. Who, who are doing the exact same things, they're being very pharisaical, which means that what were the Pharisees, Sadducees most interested in? Keeping their gig. Power. Keeping their power, that's exactly right. And it really seems as though the false teachers, not just in Corinth, but in other places too that Paul encountered, were always very concerned about their power, their prestige, and the money they made from the gospel. And was it in 2 Corinthians or was it in 1 Corinthians? Paul actually talks about we we don't charge for the gospel. It was in second, right? It was earlier on. Uh, we don't charge for the gospel. Why are they charging for the gospel? Something that should be free. Right? Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't pay your pastors, just by the way. <laughs> I think they wanted to be superior. They wanted to live better. Yeah, superior. Or whatever it took. Keep themselves yeah. puffed up. And yep. And see, Paul Paul addresses this too. Paul addresses this too in uh, where does he say some some uh, some follow uh, Cephas, some follow Apollos, some follow Paul. Yeah, he, he was in First Corinthians. Was that in First Corinthians? And and his whole point is, yeah, none are better than the rest, right? Uh, 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 see, I planted what? That was the epistle reading. It was the yeah. epistle reading for Sunday, right? And it and it's uh, uh, I planted um, uh, Apollos watered and 
and God brought the girls, right? Um, so none are better than another. Nobody is. Nobody should be looking. Nobody in this uh, spiritual gig of apostleship, pastorship, um, should be looking for um, uh, position, First power, authority, etc. First Corinthians one twelve and following is when that's all. See, there's some parallels here between the, uh, what's going on here and also the Roman Catholic Church at Luther's time of the Reformation. Oh, absolutely, right? I mean, there were there were many. I don't there know were, if anybody thought Luther was uh, gentle and mild. Yeah, that's true. No, yeah. that was not a parallel. That was, you know, not equal to. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no. He was uh, he was considered by the Pope to be a wild boar in the Lord's <laughs> Vineyard. So, not meek and mild. But he used to tell me he had a coarse sense of humor, too. He's but definitely, sport. yes, but definitely... Um, but definitely, uh, uh, that that power and authority of the church was a huge was a huge issue. Absolutely, this isn't just a uh, one time kind of a thing um, for Paul. Um, there are uh, there are even uh, uh, proclaimers, self self uh, uh, self appointed proclaimers today who would who would. Uh, Puff themselves up and their authority and power and prestige and uh, um, over and above others. Right? I mean, there would be there would be people who would call the Lutheran Church a false church, and you know, on and on. With uh, I would have no doubt. Um, number seventeen in commenting on the way he had dealt with the Corinthians previously. What explanation does Paul give? In First Corinthians two one and two about his gentle manner, well, he, he was concerned to preach Christ crucified. Period. Mm -hmm. Simple, focused message. That's it. And it goes back mean, to the parallels earlier about okay, you're not ready for solid food yet. So you're on mother's milk, and now someday we have to get you here where we are ready for solid. But food. but it's still all about the gospel, yeah. not about my position and power. Well, and I think that's one reason. I mean, on top of that, these ones that puffed themselves up and made it about them and turned people away from the essential message. So he was purposely quiet. I think so. so it would be about I, Christ. I would, assume, I would assume that some had that thought. Um, in reality, though, um, for some weird reason, many, many, many flocked to strong, puffed up, influential preachers. Then... And now, yeah. and that was really the argument of these um, influential preachers. Then is look at Paul; he's not he's not as good as we are, right? And and so uh, yes, yeah, sadly, people are drawn to that kind of that kind of thing. And the uh, the uh, 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 cult cult of personality. Is is very big um, in the church, um, so much so that when the beloved pastor leaves, people leave because they weren't really very strong Christians, or maybe not Christians, or something weird, right? But but they leave because that cult of personality is crushed, right? And then the wrong pastor comes in and. And we just don't like him. Just don't like the new pastor. So we leave. And I was like, wow, so you were here because of the strong preacher, strong personality. It just really uh, odd thing. It could probably work in reverse too, right? The humble and meek pastor leaves and then uh, a strong pastor comes in and people react. It's just, uh, but that cult of personality is really very true. Um, Twelve to the end here. Um, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, um, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves 
as though we did not greet you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limits in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you, without boasting of work already done in another, in another area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. I, I, I like that last verse. That last verse kind of, kind of uh, slams the door on all of these on all of these false preachers. Mm -hmm. um, so note verse twelve. What does measure themselves by another mean? Well, they were comparing themselves to others like Paul, who was weak and. Oh weakened. no. No, 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 uh, not that we dare classify ourselves or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. So Paul says, I'm not comparing myself with that preacher who's commending himself, who's patting himself on the back. But when they measure themselves by one another, oh, your, uh, the guide has a typo. It's just said, measure themselves by one another. Not by another, by one another. So the false teacher comparing himself to another false teacher. Mm -hmm. Kind of like looking in a mirror. mirror and commending yourself on account of... What you see. What you see on yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Commending yourself on account of yourself. So the idea is, when you measure yourself by yourself, you get yourself. You get yeah. ignorance. Ignorance. Is oh yeah, no, that's a ben It's a benefit though. It's not a bad thing. I mean, well, wait, 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 wait. It's a bad thing. But what's the benefit for the person who's comparing themselves to themselves? There's not a very high bar. Yeah. <laughs> You're always right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you can't lose by comparison. If Al always compares himself to Al, Al is going to feel pretty good about himself. If Al would actually compare himself to Sue, he would know that he doesn't measure up. Right? Sorry, Al. You were gone. And, and then you showed up while we were talking about you. <laughs> Preach it. Preach it, Pastor. <laughs> the comment I've written down is like, okay, so you're the tallest room, tallest person in a room full of midgets. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you can't you can't lose out comparing yourself to yourself. It's a win-win. Now, from the people standing outside, Nancy, you're correct. You're you're an idiot because, right? Uh, um, whatever, whatever, uh, uh, whatever your Whatever your problems are, if you measure them against yourself, you don't see, right? So, so from the outside perspective, you're correct. That's a, that's a futile endeavor. But honestly, if I'm comparing myself to myself, I'm pretty awesome. But they were all skewed because they thought their I know, but I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But it says, it says, what does measuring yourself by one another or to somebody just like you mean. Well, it means that you're measuring yourself to yourself and you look pretty good. These people look pretty good to themselves, right? But, but um, the downside of that, turn to Proverbs 3, 7. This is, this is the downside. Somebody turn to Proverbs 3, 7. Somebody else turn to Isaiah 5, 2. I got Isaiah 5. Proverbs 3 7. Nancy's got Proverbs 3 7, maybe. I do not. It's I in the Old Testament. I know. Proverbs 3 7. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Sorry. I got now Nancy is not going to do Proverbs 3 7. I, I got it. You do? Okay. Be right. not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. All right. So don't be wise in your own eyes. And Isaiah 5. Eight, verse 18 here. Yes. Isaiah 5 2. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, to yield wild grapes. 
I have the right verse, did you? <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Didn't seem to go well. Are you sure? Somebody look at that. Does he have Isaiah 5-2? Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5-2. Yeah, you dug it and cleared out stuff. Long reference? It's not Isaiah 5-2. Well, stupid is a stupid guy. Is it 2 5? Oh, I feel like it's not 2 5. You can check if it's 2 5. I feel like it's not 2 5. 15 2, 5 12. How about 5 12? You're right there. Could it be 512? They have lyre and harp, tambourine and flute and wine at their feet. <laughs> that they do not regard the deeds of the Lord or see the work of his hands. I don't think I could either. Now, now it feels like I could crowbar that into the meaning, um, but uh, no, that doesn't work either. All right. Well, anyway, from Proverbs 3 7, it's the same, it was the same thought as Proverbs 3 7, right? Don't regard yourself in your own eyes. Because when you regard yourself in your own eyes, you, you um, miss out on the truth. But I think it goes further than that, Pastor. Like you said, measure Al against Al, measure Pastor Schultz against Pastor Schultz. Even measuring Al against Pastor Schultz, that's of no value whatsoever. We need to measure ourselves within the eyes of God when He commands. Uh, See, I, so, I, keep, so, I keep comparing myself to myself a few years ago, going, you know, <laughs> whether I'm heavier or lighter. <laughs> That's a different comparison. Um, so, so why why is all this unwise? Because it distorts. It doesn't make any difference. It distorts reality, right? It distorts reality, and and the whole thing is um, uh, comparing yourself to others is also not helpful because you'll always find someone who is worse and someone who is better. So, comparing yourselves to others isn't helpful either. The only, the only standard that gives a true picture of ourselves and our motives is, well, it's the only standard that gives a true picture to ourselves and our motives. The word. God's word. Oh. Right? It's the only thing that gives um, true standard. Five minutes left. Gotcha. Um, St. Paul confined himself to the task God had given him. He did not inject himself into the work God had given others. What practical applications for this approach in the church today? The, the separation of church and state. There's things that the government should do and things that the church should do. And they're not necessarily the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have different. Right. I, I, I don't like that. I don't like that example as much. But I mean, you're correct. There are things. There are things that um, the church does, and there's things that the state does. There isn't actually separation of church and state is a fallacy in our constitution. It's, well, I mean, it's the anti-establishment clause. There is no separation of church and state. The founding fathers. The founding fathers uh, never intended for church and state to be. Um, divinely separate entities per se, right? They I mean, think that there's different responsibilities. But, but there's different responsibilities. But what about in the church, right? It's really it, um, what the, the, author, the author's question is getting at. How does that work in the church? Not, not between the church and the world. I mean, because I think you're correct, right? You're correct. There's a separate, there's a separate tasks and duties. But what, how does that work? Within I think the church. Within the context of, of what we read there, I think it means that like we're here in beautiful Savior. We are alive and well here in our church, within our community that we live, and we support missions coordinated around the world. Okay. Um, yes. What about gifts of the spirits? Uh, the spirit. I mean, we each are given different gifts. And if I if I think I yeah, that's, should, I should criticize Nancy's teaching when I'm not a teacher. That's more along the lines, right? That's more along the lines. So so uh, I I uh, it's also it's also uh, right and proper. Um, it's right and proper to have certain roles and expectations in the church, right? So one of the things you've maybe uh, maybe heard me say, somebody will ask me a question. And, and my thing right now is, 
That is a whole lot of not my job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard that. I, I don't know. Go talk to somebody else, right? I, or, or go talk I to this person. Pat was, though. Or who, what? I found out which Pat it was, though. With the stamps. Oh, good, good. Right. Oh, I told you that on Sunday. Yes. <laughs> it's like a whole lot of not my job. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what you should do with those stamps, but go do something else with them and stop bothering me. Um, no, not really. I wasn't that harsh, but it was. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's that's then how the church works, right? We don't all have to do everything in the church. Um, different gifts and different abilities have been given to different people, and so we work together for the work of the gospel. That's really what that question is getting at. I don't know. I thought it was an odd. It's nothing to do with. The... I don't think it has anything to do with the text, um, except for the uh, we do not boast beyond our limits in the labors of others. So that, I mean, I think that's the only maybe tie in. Um, uh, Paul doesn't boast in himself because others are doing another task, right? Right. Um, but I will boast in the others about the task that they're doing, but I'm not going to take, but Paul is saying I'm not going to boast about the work of Sunday school teachers because I'm not doing the Sunday school teaching. I'm not going to boast about it, but I'll boast about the Sunday school teachers because they're awesome. Right? I mean, that's kind of the, <coughs> I don't know, weird that question. Kind of weird. 20, uh, nevertheless, Paul hopes that um, God would bless and expand the work. Um, what is Paul's hope for the ministry? Oh, this goes way, way back to the very beginning when Al jumped ahead. Al, you jumped ahead to number 20. Sorry. You probably don't even, well, you probably don't even realize how you jumped ahead. But <clears throat> the whole thing that Paul wants is get past the present crisis. Grow in faith and reach out with the gospel. Right. And it's really what Nancy said to a couple questions ago when I said, eh, yes, but right, Mark gave the Mark gave the important beginning there, right? That it all kind of comes to a head here. Get past the present crisis, grow in faith, reach out with the gospel. Because right now, all of these false teachers are distracting from the work of the gospel. That's the problem. False teachers are distracting from the work of the gospel. So that's what I said before, right? If the congregation is just a country club, it distracts from the work of the gospel. If the congregation is embroiled in controversy, it distracts from the work of the gospel. If the congregation is petrified about financial woes, it distracts from the work of the gospel. If the congregation, I don't know, um, hates their pastor, it distracts from the work of the gospel. Right? All of those things distract from the work of the gospel. So get past the present crisis, Grow in the faith, repent where necessary, grow in the faith, and then reach out with the gospel. Uh, think again about verse 17. Give some examples of boasting in the Lord. Well, well, it's that joyful acknowledgement that nothing, right, that everything happens, comes through the Lord, from the Lord, by his hand, etc., etc. And not through means. And not through means. So there's, I bought this because it just, it gives me, you know, it, that boasting in the Lord is, you know, uh, don't tell the Lord you have a big problem. Tell your problem you have a big Lord. Nice. <laughs> don't don't tell your tell tell the Lord you have a big problem. Tell your problem you have a big Lord. I like that. There were two hymns I had that came to mind on that. One was "Forbid the Lord that I should go save in the death of Christ my God." Oh. And the other yeah. one was "Oh that I had a thousand voices to praise my God with a thousand tongues." My and the Lord rejoices with it, proclaim a grateful song to all wherever I might be. What great things God has done for me. That's good. That's nice. Yes. I think that's exactly what's going on with that. All right. I will be here next week. All right. I'll leave on Monday. I'll be back on Friday. All right. Well, that's good. Our other participants will probably show up then. Yeah. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do rejoice and give you thanks for your gift of uh, the gospel, uh, for gathering us together um, as a uh, church and as a congregation. And Lord, uh, keep far from us the temptations of Satan that would uh, impede the work of the gospel in this place. Um, and uh, help us uh, to renew our lives uh, uh, daily through confession and absolution and, and through... Um, and ever strengthening faith so that um, we might continue to be um, proclaimers of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. One piece. Yeah. Sure. All right. Yep. Lunch. Yep. yep. He said he was. He leaving. liked my message, so. No, I think he was joking about leaving again. <laughs>